considered a curse. This search would lead to other bays and many miles offshore. Until now, boats are fishing outside the 200 mile limit. The first port of Grave boat to fish crab was the Royal Cruiser in 1967. This boat was owned and skippered by Chess Petten Sr. The second boat was called Bird's Eye. It was fished the first year by George Petten. The price of crab in 1967 was 8 cents a pound, but dropped a couple of years later to 6 cents a pound. In 1995, the price had risen to 250 a pound. Fishermen would repair gear and make new gear during the winter months. One would head to the woods to cut staffs for their radar reflector markers, while others would begin the process of cutting twine, roping pots, and painting balloon markers. Here you see a fisherman roping pots. These are used to cut down on chafing of the crab twine and slow down wear on the twine. During construction of crab pots, twine would have to be cut the proper length and depth, and the cut edge would have to be picked off by the fishermen. this was being done, another fisherman would sew the jacket or web together. And a string would be run through the meshes on one end so the twine would be snug around the later to be installed crab pot cone. Fishing began in the spring of the year as soon as ice conditions would allow and will continue until sometime in November when the weather became too bad for fishing. Here you can see one crew loading pots aboard their boat getting ready to begin this year's fishing season. This crew member is hauling the rope aboard his boat. The distance between pots is usually from 16 to 20 fathoms or 96 to 120 feet. Each pot is stacked one on top of the other to a height that the skipper feels is safe or until all the pots and ropes are aboard and the weight of the pots are distributed uniformly. In earlier years, only a handful of fishermen carried on in the crab fishery. Those who did were permitted to fish 800 pots per boat when the supplementary crab fishery began in 1988, the new entrants were issued 150 pots. In 1993, depending on the size of the vessel, regulations again changed. Some boats would now fish 300 pots, while others could fish 150 pots, depending on the size of the vessel. were aboard for the trip, the boat would leave port and head for the fishing grounds.
skipper of a crab longliner has access to all modern equipment, from automatic pilot to depth sounder, and from, from compass to ship to shore radio. All are used for the safety and economic benefit of the individual enterprise. water and type of bottom is very important to crab habitat. While steaming to the fishing grounds, all aboard uh, will have time to relax, have something to eat, and get ready for the day's work ahead. Steaming time could be from one to two hours, or up to 25 hours or longer, depending on the weather and the area to be fished. Before reaching the area to be fished, frozen squid and mackerel will have to be uncovered and separated. Many boat owners have large fish hooks to hang the bait on. Others use pro plastic bottles or bags, while others prefer skivers hanging from the plastic cone on the inside of the crab pot. After a short fishing time in the water, the work of the awning crab pots begins. On one end of the line or fleet of pots, you see a wooden marker. This staff is made up of a radar reflector on top, a 60 inch balloon part way down, and a weight on the opposite end. This weight, this weight will keep the marker upright in the water and allow other mariners to know that there is fishing gear in the area. It will also help in locating the fishing gear by use of radar. Here you are looking at some pots coming aboard and hear the sound of rope in the hauler. Some other species. However, handling must still be a priority. 
is emptied, it is then passed across the deck to the next man, who in turn will put a new fresh bait in the pot, and then stack the pot upside down until it is ready to go back in the water. Here you see bait being strung on a skiver, ready to be placed in the pot. bait is then on in the pot and passed to his fellow crew member who again stacks the pot until it's time for setting. Most boats use four, five or six squid and one or two mackerel. This depends on the fishing time expected on a given fleet of gear as well as the presence of sea lice in the fishing area. Daytime or nighttime is not a factor in baiting crab pots. Here you see a man in the hole of a boat putting crab in a box. He's picking marketable crab from the discards. Those crab in the box that you see are all of good size with no females or soft shell. Here we have discards going overboard by way of a conveyor belt. This conveyor belt came to be used on crab boats just a few years ago. Before, crew members would hoist crab to the deck in boxes or net bags. The crab were often missing legs. Now, due to the new conveyor belt, crab are deposited back in the ocean almost immediately and a lot safer than before. have to be filled, iced, and stacked for the trip back to port. A shovel full of ice on each box, and the boxes are stacked and ready for transport. Some boats have two men in the oil. Others may have three men, depending on the size of boat and the abundance of crab or numbers of discards. The extra man can ensure that legs are inside the box so as not to be crushed. Crab, like lobster, are fish for the meat found in the legs and are considered quite a delicacy.
job in the Wheelos is very important. In addition to being responsible for the lives of his crew and safety of his boat, he has to be always looking for gear belonging to other boats so as not to set his fishing gear on top of someone else's. Pots are also set back at night time. Most boats, however, set back gear just a little slower after dark than they would in daylight, safety being the main priority. When the boat is filled out with pots, such as this one, three men are needed to do the job. One man, standing by the side of the boat, will hold the pot on the gunnels, while the second man picks the hook off the next pot. The third man lifts the pot, and the second man will tighten the drawstring, hook the pot, and pass the pot to the man at the side of the boat. This has to be done very quickly, because the boat is steaming ahead and there is only about 100 feet between pots. If great care is not exercised, limbs could be torn off, or men could be pulled overboard by the rope while gear is being set. After the pots are all in the water and the all-up is out, another marker made of balloons is put on this end for identification and for retrieving the gear. All-ups are from 75 to 100 fathoms, depending on the depth of the water being fished. Discards are again placed in boxes. The boxes are lifted from the fish hole by the boom, where one or two men will dump the boxes of crab back into the ocean. Another's day fishing complete. A boat heads in towards Porter Grave from the mouth of Conception Bay. This boat is also coming into port. This is the final trip of the season and also for the year 1996. When a boat reaches the wharf, a truck is waiting with fresh bait, empty boxes and new ice. The empty boxes are lifted off to make room for the full ones. If there is room in the hole of the boat, the empties are put below deck. If there is no room in the fish hole, the empties are left on deck until the crab is removed and the fish hole is washed out. Ice is then taken aboard for use on the next trip. The temperature in the fish hole is always cooler than the temperature outside. Due to the amounts of ice used on the crab and around the floor, and walls of the fish hole. Some boats now have refrigerated holes in addition to the ice. In 1996, dockside monitoring began. 
This monitoring was begun to protect fishermen. Checks were done on weights and condition of crab, as well as the checking of log sheets for discards, areas, undersized crab, etc. An observer was put on the wharf from each fish plant to check for the size of the crab and amounts of ice being used. The plants gave the fishermen a choice of crab being sold, tall ball, or measured 3 and 3 quarters to 4 inches and over 4 inches. The plant monitor would check one box of crab for 1,000 pounds. would then be loaded aboard a truck, the doors shut and the truck would head for the fish plant where the meat would be extracted from the shell, frozen and sent to markets in the US or Japan. for the fishermen of Portagrave to make a living from the sea. The Cod Trap Fishery. The Cod Trap Fishery was invented in the late 1860s by Captain E. H. Whitley, operating off the coastal Labrador, and introduced to Portagrave fishermen in the early 1870s. Before cod traps, fishermen used anne lines, jiggers, and baited hook and line or trawls. With the cod trap introduction, a more cost-efficient and labor-efficient method of fishing cod became popular due to the fact that cod traps could be left in one place to fish even when the men and their boats were not present. The Newfoundland cod trap usually began with a spike being driven into a rock on a point of land just a couple of feet from the eyewater hedge. A rope or cable tied to this spike was called a shore fast and was in turn tied to the trap leader. This leader was a wall of twine reaching from the surface to the bottom and from a fathom or two from the land out to where the cod trap was to begin. The cod trap was made up of four walls and a bottom. On the side facing the land, the leader would extend into the trap. Openings on each side of the leader were called doorways. Fish would follow the leader through the doorways and into this room where they would swim around the walls until the fishermen would all the trap. The fish would then be caught and taken aboard the boat. When fishermen would get to the cod trap, a man would use his gaff to pick up the watch boy. This was a float joined to a rope that was tied from the leader to the center of a trap on the outside wall. When this rope or span line was lifted from the water, the boat would be passed under this rope and the doorways tied to this span line would be hauled up preventing any fish now in the trap from getting out. Twine would now be awed from each side of the doorways to form an even smaller room. The twine on the stem and stern were called cuts. While the trap was being awed, the men would all the twine being taken aboard and twine already aboard would be kicked overboard. This would allow the boat to be pulled gradually toward the outside wall, forcing any fish in the trap to retreat to the outside wall and bottom of the trap where the twine was always smaller and was called drying twine. After a short time working this way, any fish that may be in this trap would be seen swimming by everyone aboard the boat. This was always an exciting few minutes and everyone worked just a little bit faster and guesses would be made as to the number of kennels of fish in the trap. The kennel of fish was an underweight or 112 pounds of fish when they're finally dried. When the fishermen had the size of the room that the fish were in made small enough, many fish trying to get out of the trap would become meshed in the twine. 
fishermen would have to shake those fish out and back into the trap or pick each fish out of the twine separately and put those fish down in the hole of the boat for keeping. Any children who may be aboard the boat during school holidays would be permitted to do this job. At the same time that the fish were being meshed in the twine, one man from the crew would have to go out in a small boat or flat and hook up the floats of the trap to the side of the flat to prevent any fish from escaping over the edge ropes. Daw 
nephew of Henry Daw, inherited the business in 1902. In the early years, only salt fish was bought from the fishermen. Those fishermen would clean and salt their fish and spread the fish on their own flakes. Then those fish were bought to George Dawes, where they would be culled, packaged, and sent to other countries. In 1962, a new fresh fish plant was built in Shipco. This plant was called Northeastern Fish Industries and was built by Alec Moores of Arbor Grace. When fish was plentiful, they were graded according to size. Fishermen could expect from one and a quarter cents per pound to two and three quarter cents per pound for the catch. Here you see the blubber barrels lined up on the edge of the wharf. Fish liver was dumped into those barrels. When the liver was rendered out, the cut oil was drawn off and put in clean barrels or drums and sent to market. Cod oil varied in price from $12 for a 45 gallon drum to $40 a drum. The record price was in 1942 when the price rose to $60 for 45 gallons of cod oil. The new fresh fish plant employed many men and women from the Port Grave area as well as workers from nearby communities. seventies, George Don's sons brought fresh fish. During those years, Porto Grey was blessed with two fresh fish markets. This allowed the fishermen more time on the water and therefore the opportunity to catch more fish. The two plants competing for fish and world markets improving, prices begin to rise considerably. Fish are being cleared away on the government wharf in Porto Grey Harbor. With this picture on the wharf in Ship Cove, you can notice that the men have taken their boats and headed back to their traps, leaving their wives to finish taking care of their earlier catch. Fishermen built their own flights. They would head for the woods to cut rail-sized trees for longers and bigger trees for shores. The flight would begin by the side of a hill with the outside of the flight sometimes 8 to 10 feet from the ground. This would allow the fresh air to dry the fish. Those fish are being spread. They were taken from the pile and spread, heads and tails, to conserve space. When fish were taken from salt, they were washed in clean water. Those fish were called water horse fish. They would be left in small piles called faggots and allowed to stay until much of the water was pressed from them. After this, the fish would be spread in the daytime and yaffled and put in the pile and covered with a tarpaulin at night. If the weather was sunny and too hot, the fish would have to be shaded with boughs cut on Kelly's Island or in the woods outside of Port Grave because there are no trees in Port Grave. When the fish were cured, they would be ready for market at George Dawes. Fishermen in Ibs Cove salted and cured their fish very near the wharf in their stages and on their flakes. Some fishermen haul their boats up for repairs or painting on the slipway nearby. Others left their boats on their collars, just a few feet out from their stage heads, until the next day when they would once again head for their cod traps to try and make their living from the sea, as their fathers and grandfathers did before them. The Scallop Fishery. The first boat to fish scallop from Porto Grave was the Challenger 88, owned by Calvin Petten and skippered by Gerald Petten. The Challenger 88 began fishing late in 1988 when the price for a Icelandic scallop from the St. Pierre Bank was 23 cents a pound for scallop still in the shell. The highest price for scallop in the shell was 35 cents and paid in 1996 to the Northern Challenger II owned by Harris Porter. The 
price of scallop meat in 1996 to average $6.75 a pound. This boat is fishing scallop using Labrador buckets. Those buckets are lowered into the ocean and dragged beyond the boat at a speed of about two to three knots. When the buckets are dragged for a length of time, which is determined by the individual skipper, the buckets are pulled back by use of a winch. On this boat, the buckets are lifted to the top deck of the boat. A hook is hooked on and the drag is pulled aboard. The hook is then hooked into the bottom of the drag and the buckets are lifted upside down at which time everything in the bucket will drop out or be shook out by a member of the crew. Scallop will drop down through a grate in the top deck onto a table on the lower deck. The drag is then hooked in place and lowered back into the ocean to be dragged again behind the boat. Those flat pieces of metal on the bottom of the drag are called shoes and there's a part of the drag that is actually touching the ocean floor. Any scallop left on the top deck are pushed or shoveled down through the grate and onto the table below for sorting and picking. This drag is being winched up over the stern of a 65-foot longliner. This boat on your screen has two scallop drags. One scallop drag is being emptied while the second drag is still being towed behind the boat. When the first drag is empty, it will go back into the ocean and the second drag will be taken aboard, shook out and also lowered back down to the bottom and it will again fish Icelandic scallop. Those men are picking good scallop from the rocks, coral and small scallop. The good scallop are dropped into plastic pans and the rocks are pushed into the chute that is on each side of the table. This chute will allow the discarded shells, small scallop and rocks to go back overboard and to the bottom. All marketable scallop are carefully picked from the table before the remainder is dropped overboard. The 
65 foot scallop long liner is worked in the same manner as a scallop shocking line in a fish plant. The scallop that has been put in the pans are lifted up to the table where each man will begin the labor intensive job of shucking the meat from the shell. A knife with a bent top is placed between the two halves of the scallop shell. The meat is cut from the top half of the shell and the beard and body of the scallop is taken from the bottom half and discarded, leaving the meat hanging to this half of the shell. This meat is cut clear and kept for market while the shell is dropped into the chute and returned to the ocean. This is a very time consuming job and therefore a crew of 8 to 14 men are needed for each trip which lasts from 10 to 12 days. In 1995 and 1996, scallop fishermen from Port Grave fished in the area known as Zulily and Carson Canyons. Catches were very good in this area. There was also a good fishing effort in other areas of the Grand Banks as well. Some small scattered beds of scallop were found, but quite a large area of the Grand Banks has yet to be fished. A significant bed of scallops may even be found outside our 200 mile Canadian economic zone and 1997 promises to be another year of searching for this very valuable shellfish that we find in restaurants everywhere. Each man after shucking just a few pounds of scallops will then put those scallops in a cloth bag, tie the bag and cover the scallop with ice in the fish hole until the boat returns to port. The men have to be careful when shucking scallop. Cut meats do not bring as good a price as old meats. If the forecast gives a report for high winds or heavy seas, the skipper will concentrate on getting as much scallop on board as possible, due to the fact that the scallop drags do not work as good in rough weather. The men, however, can shuck scallop in almost any type of weather aboard a 65-foot scallop dragger. All fishermen do not fish the same type of gear. One skipper may prefer Labrador buckets, while another skipper may prefer Digby buckets. Another skipper may prefer to use the Lunenburg drag or perhaps Miracle Gear. Some longliners are fitted out to tow their drags from the stern, while others may tow from the side. This longliner cleans off the table and drops discarded material back into the ocean by way of chutes. Crews may dump the table over the side or over the stern when the good scallop are all picked from the discard. Smaller fishing boats may fish one two foot bucket towed beyond that boat and powered by an outboard motor. It may haul up this two-foot bucket manually, while another fishing boat may use two 12-foot drags. Whichever boat and whatever type of gear is used, all scholar fishermen have one thing in common, and that is to try and make their living from the sea. This living could come from the more traditional fisheries, or it could come from the relatively new fishery for the port grave fishermen, the scallop fishery. The monkfish fishery began in the fall of 1993. The first Port Grey boats to fish monkfish were the nautical champion owned by Chess Petten Jr. and skipper by Dennis Fitzgerald, and the Atlantic Sea Clipper owned by Lester Petten and skippered by Neil Ederson. Both of those boats are 65 foot long runners and are used for multi-species fishing. The monk fishing is done with the use of Norwegian gill nets. Those gill nets are 15 fathoms long and each mesh is 14 inches. Those nets are hung on the thirds. This means that 45 fathoms of net 
will be hung on 15 fathoms of rope. This boat is on tying and getting ready to leave port as soon as permission is given from St. John's Arbor Traffic Center. So we'll be on the uh, we'll be on our way in a in a few moments. And the start of the project. Waiting for clearance, last minute details are attended to by the crew. When clearance is given, the stabilizers are put out and the boat is on its way to the fishing grounds. The area that those long liners are fishing is in the NAFO Division 3.0, in a depth of water from 120 to 200 fathoms. Those boats are using 120 nets in a fleet and allowing those nets to soak for 24 to 48 hours. The nets are now being run overboard. This is the first time using 14-inch mesh heel nets, and the crew are being extra careful as not to have tangles going overboard. This could cause twine to be torn, which would impair the fishing capabilities of the net. The first year, 1993, the price of monkfish was $1 per pound and was caught for the Japanese market. This price was paid for monkfish with the anon and got it. This is a color depth sounder. This sounder is showing the bottom of the ocean floor and the depth of water now under the boat. This crewman is tying on the weight to keep the all up from floating. If the weather turns bad, the end of the net could be hauled some distance due to the large balloons that is being used as markers. This rope has a tendency to float if there are no weights added to it. If the rope and balloon markers should drift, the nets would be lifted from the bottom and therefore could not fish as they are supposed to. Many fishermen use lead ropes spliced into the all-up rope to keep their nets fishing the way they are meant to be. The weights or lead rope will also cut down on the possibility of other mariners tangling their props while passing through the area. Here is the beginning of a net going overboard. After the marker and all-up is run out, the net, which is tied at the end of the all-up, is weighted down by chain or sandbags and run out. This job calls for one or two of the crew to stand close by the net box to ensure that the nets do not tangle. If this should happen, the nets could be torn, and if nets are torn too much, they have to be replaced. This is an expensive fishery, and everyone tries to keep the expenses down wherever and whenever possible. numbers on the markers will tell the skipper which fleet this is. By checking his book, he will know the length of time this fleet of nets has been fishing. Here is a common sight to the fishermen around Newfoundland. Those porpoises do not follow a boat, they swim in front of it. The water pushed away from the bow of the boat seems to massage the porpoise in much the same way as an animal being scratched under the chin or behind its ears. Sometimes porpoises will swim in front and alongside of the boat for many miles. This monkfish net is being pulled back aboard. After the marker or float is taken aboard, the yallop was followed by the gill nets being pulled over the net roller by the girdy or the net auler. There are different types of net aulers but all are operated by hydraulics. One member of the crew stands by the girdy to take the nets from the auler and to operate the controls of the auler by increasing or decreasing the speed. When the fish are taken from the net, they are placed in an aluminum chute to go to the fish box for cleaning. 
Nets are pulled back over the net table by one or two men who stows the net back in the net box after untangling any snarls that may be in the net due to fish being entangled. The net table is usually made from aluminum and is at the proper height for a man to work at untangling any fish that may come aboard. This crew is taking skate from the nets. Skate is the main bycatch of the monkfish fishery. With 14 inch mesh, they usually are easy to disentangle. Many times the fish may just be rolled in the net. When this happens and the net is unrolled, the fish fall out. In the area this boat is fishing, the bycatch of skate is greater than the bycatch of other species of fish. Fishing takes place at nighttime as well as in the daytime. The skate bycatch is cleaned by a crew member. The wings or sides of the fish are cut off and the bodies, because they are not edible, are discarded. The taste of skate wings is very similar to scallop. Those are monkfish coming in over the net roller. Monkfish are also known as goosefish, American angler, and by a host of other names. This sluggish bottom living fish is found at all depths of water and therefore can tolerate a wide range of temperatures. They do, however, prefer temperatures of from 6 degrees to 10 degrees Celsius. Monkfish have a very large head and enormous sized mouth. It has a large fin on each side of its body and two small fins underneath just back from the head, with a fin sticking up from the back. Towards the tail of the monkfish, there is another fin standing up from the back, as well as a fin hanging down from the underside. When cleaning the monkfish, a cut is made from the navel of the fish up through the skin to a point between the two small fins hanging from the underside of the fish, just back from the head. Much care is taken in the removal of the liver. If the liver is removed very carefully, with no cuts or tears, and packed in clean sanitary containers with ice. The price could be a dollar a pound. The liver sent to Japan where it is used in sushi. This fisherman is weighing a monkfish to get some idea as to the weight of this fish compared to others of equal volume. When the monkfish is clean, it goes to the wash box where it is washed before going down in the fish hole to be iced in. Here, monkfish are not really plentiful. Therefore, one man is doing the job of cleaning, taking care of the liver, weighing, washing, and putting the fish below deck. While this is going on, the other crewmen are taking back, picking the fish from the nets, and all in the nets back to the net box. The men take turns doing the different jobs aboard the boat.
This is the Atlantic Sea Clipper Fishing Monkfish in NAFO Division 3-0. Another bycatch while fishing monkfish is Atlantic Olibut. This fish is also a bottom dweller and considered quite a delicacy. Olibut fish is a high price in markets both at home and abroad and fishermen take a considerable amount of time in cleaning and handling this fish. gut and gills must be taken out and any blood around the bone must be removed with a small scraper. Fish is then washed on the inside with a hose, put in the fish hole and completely covered with ice. Occasionally cod becomes entangled in this 14 inch monkfish gill net gear. When a cod is caught in twine of this size, it is usually quite large. Those large cod are referred to locally as soakers. By unrolling the net, those cod are easy to extract from the gear. Purposes are back and swimming ahead of the boat, sometimes in excess of 10 knots. They are very friendly fish, and as we head for home, it seems as if they too are hoping that we can continue to make a living from the sea. With the help from this relatively new fishery for Newfoundland, the Monkfish Gillnet Fishery. The world's largest colony of tours are Bacalo birds as they are locally called, occupies the Funk Islands just off the northeast coast of Newfoundland. Each year they come south past Conception Bay searching for food. Over the past few years their death toll has been rising due to the dumping of Bunker Hile from the bilges of large boats.